coming. Uh, my name is Elian Batora. I'm in the sort of electrical engineering department here. Uh, so it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Pramod Karganakar. I've uh, I've known him since I was a graduate student, you know, in the early days of my graduate studies, and, and uh, you know, many of the conversations that I that I had with him at that stage ended up kind of nucleating a lot of the ideas that I've worked on over the last ten years. So, um, uh, you know, he's a he's a scholar in the truest sense of the word. One of these people that's intensely curious, and, and that's kind of rare, I think, at this stage in one's career to continue to see it. Not to say that you're old. <laughs> he, he is my academic grandfather. By the way. Uh, for those of you who are students of control theory, uh, uh, Ramod has kind of started his career in control and, uh, uh, and had probably the most seminal paper in robust control published in the, the late 80s, fondly known as DGKF. So for those of you who study control, I recommend that. Um, he's won every possible award there is to win in, in, in the field of control, and he's also kind of contributed to academia and its growth in many different capacities as the Dean of Engineering at the University of Florida, as the Chair of the Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Michigan, uh, as Deputy Director at ARPA-E, and most recently, well, prior to his current role as the Head of the Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation. And currently, he's the Vice Provost for Research at City of California, Irvine. Uh, so for those of you who have a chance to meet with him today, I encourage you to, to do so and ask him as many questions as you can. He actually helped me, I mean, when I, I remember when I was a student, uh, he helped me prove uh, some of the lemmas that were important to kind of getting towards some of the main results. So uh, 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 without further ado, I'll, I'll let Ramon tell us about this. Thank you, Elian. <laughs> and Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here at Cornell, one of the greatest universities uh, in the United States and in the world, uh, and part of the Cornell Energy Systems uh, Institute uh, seminar series. Uh, I want to say a couple of things by way of background before I kind of uh, give the talk. Uh, like Elian said, I am a control theorist by training. That's all. Uh, that's what I did for most of my life. And in fact, I didn't study power systems after my undergraduate. So I, I'm, I'm a double undergraduate from IIT Bombay, and uh, I finished in '77. That will date me and age me. Uh, and that was the last time I studied power systems. Uh, and then I got into control and never looked at power systems and energy, none of this stuff, until I went on sabbatical to Berkeley. Uh, in 2010, and that's when I met Elian and his advisor, who was my former student, and Praveen Varaya, and they taught me everything I know about energy. And so, for me, energy has been a recent game. It's like, I, pretty much I've learned whatever I learned in the last 10 years. I know there are experts in this room in, in power systems, in energy, and so uh, I stand in front of you as a, as a sort of neophyte novice uh, in the field, but uh, kind of picked up a few things here and there, so that's what you're going to hear today. So the outline of my talk is, um, is sort of in five, six pieces, uh, why renewable? Uh, for this audience, that's, that's sort of obvious, but uh, it's a broad audience. So I'm going to talk about a few things that hopefully will have some insights, uh, some key trends. Again, most of it you know, but some of it you may not. Uh, then I'll talk about towards 100% renewable future. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about the kinds of things that we have done, and then uh, just picked on one result to kind of give you a flavor of the kind of research that we do uh, with, my, with my students and my group. So that hopefully I can cover all this. Uh, so why renewable? I'm sure you've seen this chart or some version of this chart uh, somewhere in your courses. It's the uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, d going back to 1990, the data is from this global carbon project, which is really a wonderful repository for great, uh, great data on what's going on with our climate. Um, it has 2017 projection, which is, I think, pretty much on, on target. I think it may even be higher than 36.8 gigatons of CO2 uh, last year. We have been on this increasing growth curve since even 1990. So just in the last 20, 30 years, we have dramatically increased our CO2 emissions. And 
even though I'm going to talk about renewables and all the adoption and all this stuff, the fact of the matter is CO2 is still growing. So for the last two years, it had flatlined, and people were very excited that maybe this flatlining means that they are going to actually go down. But alas, that's not true. Uh, oh, I don't know. And so you can, uh, again, this is very, very well known stuff. I'm just going to uh, use that to, to set my talk up. Uh, so CO2 uh, emissions and temperature change. So the, the solid part of the curve is what's already been experienced. And then the remaining are all various projections using various different models of various pathways uh, under different kind of scenarios, uh, business as usual, no policy to very kind of aggressive policy for decarbonization. And uh, the main thing I want you to notice that if you really want to have any chance of going below two degrees Celsius, almost all curves require you to go below zero in net CO2 emissions. That is, there is just no way to get there without negative emissions technologies. So if, if you are thinking long-term <laughs> research, that's the path you want to be on because uh, and in fact, the IPCC report that just came out, I think, in the last two to three weeks, point to that even one and a half degree Celsius increase, for which they give only 10 years of sort of window left for us, uh, is going to have pretty devastating consequences. So we, we need to turn this curve around, which is on an increasing path to, to uh, peak and then start to go down really, really fast. And I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I think we the next Decade or two decades will kind of tell the story on whether we are going to actually do this or not. Um, this, uh, as you know, all these models are probabilistic. So the simple way to think about what's ahead of us is to ask the question, how much CO2 is left to emit? And so this is an answer, uh, remaining CO2 quota uh, for 66% chance of keeping below 2 degrees Celsius. And this is 20, I think this was 2016. Uh, so this number has gone down since then. Uh, we had about 800 gigatons of CO2 left to emit. So if you take whatever, 30 at 40, depending on what numbers and assumptions you want to use, we really don't have much time left before we will use up all that quota and, and the two degrees Celsius will be baked in. And like I said, the latest IPCC report says that we probably have like 10 to 15 years left to, to do this. Okay, so that's again a, in a very short nutshell why we care. Now, uh, if you look at global energy consumption, uh, most of it is from fossil fuels. So natural gas, oil, and coal combined together, uh, you know, it's like 70, 80, 80%. 80 Renewables uh, are 13.4%, uh, of which solar and wind is one and a half, hydro is two and a half, and but biofuels and waste is mostly wood burning. Wood burning. This is not modern renewable biofuel. This is, uh, this is like you know old-fashioned uh, energy. Uh, I'm going to speak mostly on the electric energy sector, uh, which is a, a piece of the puzzle. Certainly not the whole puzzle by any means. Uh, again, uh, natural gas, coal, oil, of course, doesn't play a big role for the electricity sector. It's mostly natural gas and coal from fossil fuel side. Good amount of nuclear. Hydro now contributes a lot. So 22%, I mean, 16% comes from, from hydro. Uh, biofuels and waste, that's like uh, using waste to generate electricity. Uh, so that's that piece. And then now solar, wind, and geothermal uh, rise up to about 5%. Um, I'm going to focus on this because mostly that's where the biggest progress has been made and continues to be made, and that's what I know about. But there is this whole other piece, which is the transport sector. So even if we completely solve this problem, there is still the transport sector, which I'm not going to say anything other than to say that if you want to decarbonize the way we want to, we need to, the transport sector has to be solved. And the current viable approach to that is either electric vehicles or fuel cells. The third approach, which is like biofuels, hasn't worked out as well as we thought back in the 2000s, but like the huge excitement of producing cellulosic ethanol that whole story hasn't worked out as well as we would have liked. And this is sort of last slide on the big picture. This is from uh, the source for this data is Vaclav Smil, which is one of the real uh, visionaries in, in the energy field. This is really cautionary. Uh, and what, what this does is it says, how much penetration do you get 
uh, in 60 years. Okay. So coal, which was like the first big fossil fuel we started to use, it took uh, in in five in 60 years we went from 5 percent to 50 percent of energy. Oil only went up to 40 percent in 60 years. Natural gas only went to 25 percent in 50 years. Uh, in 60 years. So what you see is a trend that occupies less and less fraction of total energy mix as new sources come in. The truth of the matter is, this is what Vaclav Smil points out, is that every source of energy that mankind has ever known in its history is still in use. So think about that for a second. We, start, we were using wood for energy for a very long time. We are still using wood. It's not gone away. That's what the story. So if you want to extrapolate modern renewables are 5% today, will it take us 60 years to get to 20%, that would be a very bad future. We hope that not, but this is the caution. This is really, the point of this slide is energy is all about scale. If it doesn't scale, it's good. It's really not going to make a difference. It's just not going to make a difference. And scaling is so bad. Uh, at the, on top of this, 1.2 billion people lack access to electricity. That number has gone down, by the way, since I wrote that slide. I think that number is now closer to a billion people. So we can't wait. You can't tell them to wait <laughs> uh, for us to fix our problems. So they need electricity today. And actually, renewables are playing a very big role there, actually, uh, uh, dis uh, grid disconnected electricity. And I think what is much worse, actually, is the second part, second line. I mean, the bottom line there is 2.8 billion people still use biomass for cooking and heating. These are mothers with their children in developing world, like really bad for their health. They're inhaling all this soot and particles. So to modernize the energy system is really, has a huge humanitarian. Besides the carbon emissions and global warming, there is a humanitarian aspect to this, this picture. Okay, enough said about energy. I can go on like this for a long time, but I don't want to do that. This is where optimism, so I, I said many things that might make you pessimistic about our future, but there, is, there are some reasons to be optimistic. And this is the first slide that is a reason to be optimistic. Is this dramatic improvement in cost of PV solar. It's just been absolutely, absolutely astonishing. Uh, so this is data from NREL. It's too small for you to read, and I'm not going to bother reading. But almost everywhere, whether it's utility, utility scale uh, solar, or uh, rooftop solar or commercial trackers, without trackers, almost everywhere there is decrease in cost. And in, in some areas, we are getting pretty close to the sunshot goal of dollar per watt DC installed. Uh, most of the cost now is in what is called balance of system. It is not in the, in the cells. It's really the rest of electronics and inverters and installation and construction. That's what is costing us uh, most of the money nowadays. Uh, and as a result, there has been just tremendous growth in PV installed. Uh, it, right, as of 2017, we are at 402 gigawatts of, uh, of uh, PV installed. This curve, interestingly, has gone higher than all projections. So every year there have been projections to how much PV we are going to get. This curve exceeds. Has been going on like this for like at least the last seven, eight, ten years. Will it continue? I don't know. Uh, but it's certainly uh, the, the growth is uh, as close to exponential as, as one gets. Yet, this is not making a dent in our CO2 emissions. So although we got all this installed, our CO2 emissions are still going up because we got the transport sector, we got growth in energy demand worldwide with uh, India and China coming, uh, becoming econ economic uh, power. Same with wind. Wind costs have come down and wind uh, installed capacity has grown. Uh, this is not cumulative. This is uh, annual annual totals, um, but it's I think in, in excess of 500 gigawatt. In fact, it exceeds uh, the, the installed solar. What that has done, and this is really sort of pointing to the rest of my talk, is that there are now examples worldwide of very deep levels of renewable penetration in the electric sy system. And these are specific dates uh, in various parts of the world. So you see November 2015, 70% wind in Spain, Germany 67%, Australia 61%. Uh, so I'll show you some more data from, from California in, in, in a few minutes. But 
Uh, and Denmark is 140 percent. You might wonder about that in case you have never thought of it. What does that mean? What it means is that Den Denmark is producing more than they consume. So they sell the rest of it to Germany and Netherlands and they are grid connected to Sweden and some other parts of, the, uh, of Northern Europe. So or same with Scotland. Scotland is 153 percent. What it means is they are selling some of this stuff to England to which they are grid connected. So that is what it means. But basically what it shows is that it is possible to get up to fairly high levels of renewable penetration. Yeah. So the, um, so the 67 percent in Germany, yeah. is that in part because of purchases from Denmark or is that? I think it's, it, I think it's, I think it's their own production. Okay. Okay. I believe that number, I, speaking from memory now, I, I think it's their own production. Yeah. yeah. You're claiming 52 percent in the U.S., am I reading this right? No, no, no. 52 percent of the southern power pool on oh. 13th of February. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, let's see. Yeah, no, no, in fact, if you really want the, I mean, the, the hard data are about. Yeah, I, I just wasn't clear of the notation. Yeah, the notation is, these are examples, right, got it. isolated right. examples that we have done on certain days of the year, very high ah, levels of penetration. Okay. In, that in showing part it. Of the US only, yeah, right? okay. uh, yeah, only, like this is CAISO, which is California yeah, system thank operator. Thank you. No, no problem. Please ask. That, that's the only way. So. We can aspire then to reach 100 percent renewable future on the electricity side. This has, a, has become a somewhat controversial topic, which I have no intention of going into. But there have been lawsuits on scientific papers in this area. Uh, let me just stop with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. However, California uh, just in the last few months um, announced that uh, California will become, become 100 percent clean electricity by 2045. Uh, Jerry Brown just signed that order. That's the headline from Los Angeles Times uh, in September. And uh, not only did he say that, they uh, or the legislature uh, in, in uh, State Bill 100 said that electric utilities and other service providers generate 60 percent of their power from renewable by 2030. So they have accelerated, California has accelerated uh, the adoption of, of clean power. Now this is clean and not renewable. Okay, so clean includes new, new, potentially nuclear and certainly hydro and so forth. Uh, yeah. Is this the mandate that also stipulates that all new resi resi residential kind of construction below two stories has to have? I don't know the answer. Stories? I don't know. It could be. It could be included in the SB 100. I just don't know the answer to that. Anyhow, so, so already there are states like California sort of aiming towards what I thought was, what I said is aspirational future. I think they are like they are saying that we are going to get there. Okay. Uh, for those of you who haven't thought much about electric grid, here is like in two slides, I am going to tell you how electric grid works. I know there are people in this room who are like, who have spent their whole career uh, working on electric grid. So for them, you know, just bear with me. And for those who don't know this, so the it's considered the greatest achievement of 20th, 20th century uh, by a National Academy of Engineering. So they listed the top 10 achievements of engineering. This came out as number one. This included internet, included television, space travel, automobiles. Above all, electrification was the number one achievement of engineering in 20th century. The goals are to, to provide economic, reliable, sustainable access to electricity. It consists of generating the electricity, transmitting it, distributing it and consuming it. It's governed by laws of physics, electromagnetics, and circuits. Uh, and it is a, it's an interesting thing because there is, it, it's a mix of technology and engineering with economics. Because these some, in some parts of the country and the world, it's done through markets. Uh, to get the most efficient generation, you exercise the power of free markets. Over the last 100 years, an elaborate control system multiple time scales and multiple spatial scales has arisen to manage this and control the system. It's the largest, single largest engineered system uh, on the planet. So all of the electric grid, say this part of the country is all connected at 60 hertz. Everything is operating in synchrony at 60 hertz east of the Rockies. East of the Rockies, up to Quebec, up to Florida, everything is completely connected, operating at 60 cycles per second, which is 16 millisecond. Uh, and everything is just complete harmony 
operating. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing that it actually works, you know. And it's multiple spatial and time scales. So time scales range from milliseconds for protection circuits to years for planning and everything in between. So this system has time scales going from milliseconds to seconds to minutes to hours. And there are dynamics and phenomena happening at all these time scales. And this is all managed through this elaborate management and control system. A piece that I'm going to focus on today's talk is a critical constraint in the system which makes it very unique and very challenging as an engineered system is uh, what is called the balancing. Uh, supply must demand at pretty much every instant of time, essentially because there is no storage. So you generate power, you must consume power pretty much at the same time. And that that's very different from almost any other form of commodity that we use. So think water, think food, think anything else that we use on a daily basis, this constraint doesn't apply. But for electricity, this is a, a huge constraint. And what's astonishing is that this constraint is met at every instant over this continent scale system, completely deregulated, uh, decentralized, with billions of points where electricity is being consumed. So I think that's one of the reasons why this is considered to be this great engineering achievement. It's like, how do you do this at 60 cycles per second to manage this over this continent scale system? Uh, so what's the, what's the, how, how does it, so I'm going to sort of unlock the mystery a little bit for those of you who, who haven't thought about this. So how do we currently achieve this supply demand balance? So what the paradigm says is the following. Demand I have no control over. Well, you will consume what you want to consume. You're not going to ask my permission to consume what you want to consume, right? So people will consume what they consume. Companies will consume what they consume. So you take demand as exogenous. Now when you uh, combine demand over lots of users, there is some pattern to it. There is a daily pattern, there is an hourly pattern, there is a monthly pattern, there is a weekly pattern. Like weekends are different from weekdays, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so you take demand as a, as a given, and then you have got supply, which is generation, either your uh, natural gas-fired plant, or a nuclear plant, or a coal-fired power plant. You adjust the supply to meet the demand. That's the control paradigm. Okay? And that's done through uh, a series of markets, so you run markets day ahead, then you run markets during the day, and intra-hour, and then sub five minute, you use frequency control to maintain 60 hertz frequency, and that ensures supply demand balance. So that's sort of the control architecture that gets it done. So frequency control in real time, day ahead and intra-day feed, feed. So if those, who are, those of you are control types, it's like a mix of feed forward, a lot of feed forward planning control, and then ultimately some feedback control around frequency. And that's how the system works. Okay. Now what's happening is that this paradigm is not going to work in the foreseeable future because of the growing penetration of renewables. Why? Because I said that the approach to this problem is by controlling, I'm going to control supply to meet the demand. Well, if my supply is renewable, it's random. It's, it's, it's not controllable. It's coming from solar and wind, and I cannot order the sun to shine and wind to blow. I mean, so this paradigm is going to change and that's like the focus of what we, so this basically shows the, the challenge. Uh, this is uh, actual data from 2006 from Teha Chapi uh, wind farm in California. You see those plots, uh, they're the actual output from the wind farm. Each color is a day in the month. So this is the month of June, so there are 30 graphs on that chart. Each color is a day. There is no average day. So the, the, although there's this solid blue line is the average, but really every day looks different from every other day. And this is that randomness. So imagine that the whole supply was coming out of wind. Every day would look, <laughs> look something like this. Now you to, your, your problem as an operator is to manage the supply demand balancing under this constraint. So that is the challenge. And this variation, although I'm not going into the details, but there's a lot of work done on this. This variation has frequency components in, in, in wide range of frequencies. So this wind varies at multiple time scale, including annual time scales, which is kind of pretty amazing if you think about it. That wind power output aggregate over a year varies from year to year. Pretty interesting. Just to show you, just to give you some flavor for what's happening, so this is actual data from California, um, May 13, uh, 2017. So you had, uh, you know, geothermal. So the base, base lines are the traditional sources of power, 
and then you have wind, and then you look at this huge solar that comes on as the sun rises. And so you go from about 40, uh, I'm sorry, 6 gigawatts to 14 gigawatts. Well, first of all, you rise to 12 gigawatts in a like, couple of hours. As the sun comes out, you suddenly rise up. And then you stay at that very high level of generation. And then you go down as the sun sets. Yeah. So for the last one, so yeah. the wind is going to be amazingly stable. Yeah, on that day. On that day. But it's not the case. No, not, not generally. And also, remember my scale, right? So look at this is like 2 gigawatts. So it's still variable. Still variable. But the sun, I mean, it's really, because of the installed capacity, and it really is a function of the sunshine. Uh, but wind varies a lot as well. Okay? So don't, don't let that fool you. I mean, that just happened that day. So what you can do as a, as a, as to understand the system level aspect is you can take your load. Okay, you can take your total load, subtract the renewable, and you get what is called the net load. So this is the load which, has, which is variable over day because you know, uh, during the day consumption changes, you subtract, and that net load, which is, the, which is the line below, has to be met by the rest of the supply. All right? And this is where the challenge comes in. Because the rest of the supply has to go from, say, at a low of about whatever, from here to here in the space of like three or four hours. Ramp up. So somebody has to come online, i.e. fossil fuel or, or nuclear, or somebody has to meet that change. Okay? As we increase the renewable penetration, as the sun sets, somebody else is going to have to make up for all that. And that's the challenge in, in getting to the 100% renewable future. As a result, what is happening is, California routinely experiences uh, negative prices. Remember, I told you that in California, market is deregulated. So it happens through electricity markets. During the day, there is a lot of sun, a lot of production. Too many players wanting to produce. The economic system signals that you've got too many producers trying to be in the market by setting negative prices. That is, you have to pay to produce. This is becoming more and more frequent in California. So I'm going to now show you some system level results, which uh, kind of bring this whole thing into a focus as to what's ahead of us. So this is a study uh, from NREL in 2016. And they said, OK, we're going to study what will happen if our renewable percentage goes up. Okay. Uh, and so they did it in terms of annual solar energy contribution. So the x-axis is how much we are getting from solar. And y-axis is how much of this I will not be able to accept because I got other generators in the system. So they have, I'll talk about this notion of flexibility. But basically, you got other generators like nuclear. You cannot turn them on and off. You got coal, which is hard to cycle up and down. So you make some assumptions about the generation stack in California. Uh, and they showed that even already at like 15, 18%, you begin to curtail solar. You cannot take all the solar. So you must leave something off the grid. As the, penetration, as the solar energy penetration increases, that curve shoots up. So already by like 22, 24%, you're losing about 40% of the solar energy being produced on an annualized basis. What is worse? That by itself would be bad news. I mean, this is, this is not good news in terms of operating the grid. It's the marginal curtailment curve, which is like much worse. What is that? Let's say that we have built some amount of solar already. And now I'm going to produce, uh, I'm going to add one more solar plant. What's, how much of that can I accept on an annual basis in the grid production? Well, you, have to, you lose like 40, 60, 70% by 22%. You look, at, look at the. Look at the rejection of solar at that, even at like modest levels of, of solar penetration. What that is saying is that it's going to become more and more economically unviable to put the capital investment to, to do that. Why would you do it? Because you're not, the, your stuff is not going to get used. You're not going to get paid for this stuff. So impact of curtailment on the cost, they, they, so they go through the analysis. Uh, in terms of like, what is the actual cost of PV solar then, if all of this is going to get thrown out? And those numbers increase dramatically. 
so you go from 6 cents per kilowatt hour which is pretty okay it's still not i mean it's still higher than natural gas but okay i we can accept 6 cents but by 20 25% penetration you are at 15 cents per kilowatt hour you are totally uncompetitive at this point yes none of these projects can even include storage no no this is with with the more or less current grid current set of operators current set of production with what they call limited grid flexibility so you know, so this is assuming a certain certain kind of s set of operators that are in the in the system. So the argument is that unless we make the grid much more flexible, we are not going to get there. Yes. Is California, selling uh, California actually ends up buying from Arizona and. Uh, no, I mean this is a this is not actual. This is not like uh, data from actual. This is like a simulation study. Okay of what would happen if we were to get up to 22%, 24% annualized solar contribution. This doesn't exist today. Mention what happened during that time when there's an excess, is that the fossil fuel plants, as we showed in the duck curve yeah. previously, yeah. they uh, either go offline or they go down. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, but what, what I think the study shows is that they can only go so much. So much yeah. They can only go so much. You're not going to take a nuclear off the grid. It's not possible. So this is the baseline. Yeah, yeah. So this study assumed a certain arc, certain um, a set of producers. Yeah, and they assume some assumptions on coal coal cycling, like how much can you cycle coal, how fast you can cycle coal. So they make those types of assumptions, and they do an annualized uh, simulation. So it's not like a, for a, for a single day; it's like over a whole year. Yeah. Just to use your word for, to this idea of not taking nuclear off the grid. So yeah. obviously it's a market. And why does nuclear have no, it's, it's like it's hard to turn it off. It's like physically it's hard to turn it off. I know, but that doesn't mean it, you can't turn it off. No. You, I keep, uh, yeah. What happens is that uh, they are willing to even go on at zero cents or negative. Yeah, the, right. Let's just stay on. Yeah, yeah. I it's, see. Not, it's the market that is I driving see. it. I see. It's not that there's no regulation to say that. No regulation, but I think as an engineered system, they are not designed to be taken off the grid. Even coal, which is easier than nuclear, there is tremendous price to pay for cycling coal. So if you want to go up and down on coal, you pay in terms of emissions, actually. So it's not just, so it's like, age, it's like components get destroyed, you, you have extra emissions because you're cycling. So cycling this, the best plant, if you're going to cycle, is natural gas. So, so hydro, of course, hydro is clean. So I'm, hydro is clean, but of the fossil fuel, the best plant to cycle is combined cycle uh, natural gas plant, sure. which is extremely efficient, like 60% efficiency. Uh, so if you're going to do that, that's the best way to do it. So flexibility is the maximum upward or downward change in supply demand balance that a power system is capable of meeting over a given time horizon and given initial operating state. So, over, so you can ask the question, like in one hour, how much can I take it up or take it down by? And that's where all the constraints come in, like, you know, what can you really do realistically? So this is not, of, you know, as a theorist, this is not like a really mathematically solid definition. It's like an intuitive definition. So you really, and, and so this paper of Cochran et al. kind of lays out options for flexibility. Again, this chart may be hard to read, so I'm going to give Elian the slides and you can kind of magnify. But on the x-axis are various different kinds of options. So you have system operations, you have markets, you have load, flexible generation, networks, and storage. And on y-axis is the cost. So if I want to get flexibility, so like storage is our big <laughs> holy grail right now, except it's very expensive to get. So ideally, if we can push this down, we can get flexibility on the cheap, and that would alleviate a lot of these problems. Uh, but you can achieve the similar thing by building more transmission, but that takes years and years to do. Or you can try to do that with flexible generation. Uh, you can try to do that with load management. And so there are these different options with different price points. And so the whole game is to go from here to there for operating the electricity system is getting these flexibility options to become cheap enough that we can use them to do the supply demand balance. So it's going to be like the future will be Random supply, random demand, flexibility options, mix the three up to meet that equation of supply equals demand at an economic. So this is the control that's coming in the future, which is why I think why this is an interesting area for controls people. 
You were going to say something? Yeah. yeah. Just a question about yeah. storage. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned kind of the electrification of the transportation center. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in a sense, if you do transition to electric, plug in electric yeah. vehicles, yeah. you have storage yeah. for free. I mean, in the sense those batteries are plugging into the yeah. yeah. There's not being utilized. Right. So there are two there are two issues with that, right? There are two issues that one is what level of penetration do you need for this to become like a viable option on the electricity side at, at scale? So that's so that's a, like can we go fast enough on adoption of EVs to be able to offer you the flexibility? And then the timing, right? Like when do people want to charge their cars relative to when the renewables are available? Can we manage all that thing? And again, I'm not saying that it can't be done. It certainly is going to be an option. How big a role it will play? I mean, you know, the, you got people who are system modelers here. Maybe they can try to simulate that kind of stuff to see, like, at what scale, like, how many million of EVs do I need to meet, say, 25% or 30% renewable, or like California wants to be 50% renewable, things like that. So, in my opinion, like, I just try to make the case that control systems will play a major role in getting to that future of the supply demand balancing. And that's just one piece of the puzzle. Like I said, you know, there's a, there's a whole laundry list of things. But for renewables, this is like the, the most, um, the biggest problem area for us to think about. So what have we done? So we have worked on, in several different parts of this puzzle, um, renewable producers in electricity markets, strip packing for peak load minimization, causation-based cost allocation principles and algorithms, cybersecurity and smart grid, distributed control, and stochastic optimization. And uh, I possibly can't tell you about everything. I put down my website where we got all the papers and all the presentations. You can download and look at them at your leisure, depending on what you're interested in. I'm just going to very quickly give you a summary of the kind of questions we ask. And then in the remaining time, I'll show you one result, which will give you a flavor of the mathematics that we end up employing. So this was work that actually started with Elian was his, <laughs> doing his PhD thesis uh, of uh, so far, we assume that we take all the renewables that comes into the system. Well, at some point, and it's already happening, it's happening in Europe, it's going to happen in the US, that they will say renewables also have to play in the same market that everybody else does. Well, except that renewables have a different problem because their supply is random. They don't know, whereas a coal producer or a, a, knows exactly what he or she can produce. So how should they operate in the market? What's the best bidding policy? Can renewables combine their resources to reduce their uncertainty and gain more profit? The answer is yes. We use cooperative game theory to, to prove that. So what's the, is there a benefit from several renewable generators combining your production? In fact, the more you average, the more you reduce the uncertainty. Geographical averaging is a, is a big piece of this puzzle. Uh, what are the strategies to keep the correlation stable? So we worked on that. And what if there is a local storage for a renewable? So you've got some solar plant with a small amount of storage. In fact, we just had that paper accepted, right, Elian? Yes. So it, it's going to appear uh, in, in a journal very soon. So that was one of our papers that, <laughs> that we started to work on when, when Elian, like I said, was a grad student. Uh, another stream of work we did with my, friend, uh, my colleagues at Florida, where I used to be, uh, is use stochastic optimization. So imagine a residential neighborhood. You've got a bunch of households with local renewable generation, maybe some rooftop solar, maybe some storage, maybe some elastic and elas elastic loads like washing machines and you know, pool pumps. And so, so you have a mix of must-run loads and some that are flexible loads. Uh, and we use kind of a queuing-based approach here. So they, be, they go into a queue, and you service that queue by buying electricity, and you sort of minimize the total cost that's paid by the residential household. So we applied stochastic optimal control type of approaches to this, and we proved stability of the queue using kind of Lyapunov-like techniques. Uh, and we used a similar approach for data center optimization, which is like a big, interesting area for players like Google and Amazon that run these huge data centers. They want to go green. They have exactly the same problem. And so we have applied this stochastic optimization so we got points on performance and things like that. So that's a, a stream of work that we, we have done. Then a third area uh, is collaboration with, with a friend of mine who was a computer scientist, Artaj Sani, who actually is a Cornell PhD from a long time ago. Uh, and so he's an expert in computer science. And we started to talk. And he said, 
uh, you know, we're talking about load management and how we can manage the loads to reduce the peak, because reducing the peak has a lot of benefits that I don't want to go into, but it's very important. And he said, well, that just sounds like a strip packing problem in computer science. So the strip packing problem is very simple. I give you a bunch of rectangles okay, of varying height, height and width, and you have to fit them so that the, max, so the peak is minimized while fitting in a box of, say, base 1. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an NP-hard problem, so it, it, you can't really solve it you know, with sort of guaranteed uh, uh, you know, convergence and things like that. But there are lots of very nice heuristics that you can prove bounds on how well your heuristic performs relative to the optimal. So we have published a number of papers using uh, the strip packing, uh, the guaranteed bounds and deviation from optimality. This is another area that we worked on with a, with a, a former PhD student of mine. And here the question we asked was the following. These renewable generators are going to impose cost on the system. Why? Because they're variable. And they, they have this randomness and variability. So who should pay for this? Until now, public policy says, well, you know, don't worry about the cost. Let's just take all of the renewables. Well, in the future, as the penetration increases, this is going to become a problem as to who should pay for. So sort of the obvious answer is that whoever causes the cost should pay for it. Easier said than done. Because you can't differentiate an electron from a renewable from an electron coming from a fossil fuel plant. So how do you do this? So we actually came up with an axiomatic approach. So, we, so, so you can write down principles that are essentially this idea of whoever causes the cost should pay for it. You can turn that into principles, and then you can turn this into a math problem. So can you come up with an algorithm that will implement this causation-based, uh, so we use tools from cooperative game theory to come up with a you know, very nice axiomatic formulation of this causation based. Uh, so this paper appeared uh, recently in, in transactions on power systems. Uh, I won't talk about cybersecurity because that's a very, very big deal. Uh, it's a different topic, so let me just skip. Other than to say that we worked, we have done some work on cybersecurity for the smart grids. And then demands and management. So in whatever time I have left, and Elian, tell me how much time do I have? Because I just want to give a flavor for one. We have about five minutes, but I mean, ten minutes. Well, yeah. Okay. I then I will just show the I will just show you the result, and then you know math you should read anyway. Kind of you know you should read on your own probably. So the ba so in this part of the world, the goal was to exploit the inherent flexibility of electric loads. Electric loads are flexible. Washing machine. Uh, uh, especially water heater, pool pumps, there is flexibility in them. You don't have to run them exactly at, at uh, any random time. And there are two approaches to, in, uh, to exploit this inherent flexibility, is incentive-based and price-based. So you can incentivize people to change their behavior, or you can price it in the electricity. You can just change the price of the electricity so that people will change their behavior. And there is centralized control of loads, especially in Florida. Florida Power and Light has direct control of all pool pumps in, in Miami area. And in fact, they actually use it in summer. What's the total kind of capacity? I don't know the answer. But it's, it's, it's very large. So in summer afternoons, they are using the pool, direct control of, of pool uh, pumps. And they run them at night or whatever to sort of minimize the summer peak. Because you've got AC. You don't want AC and pool pumps to be kicking in at the same time. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's in use. But you can also, but that you know is, can be only done in some areas. You're not going to do centralized control everywhere. So the other approach is distributed control, where central authority will send some kind of a control signal, either price or an incentive. And people will do what they want to do. They will make their own decisions. And so the question we asked, analytical question we asked is, what is the optimal? What's the worst case ratio of performance of a distribu decentralized distributed decision making versus a centralized optimal planner? And that's called price of anarchy. And so, so this is like pros and cons of uh, distributed control. So price of anarchy is this ratio of worst case objective function of a game using distributed control over centralized optimal. So let me see if I can just show you. Our main result is the, is the third bullet. So what we did is we, we set up this game problem using, uh, uh, not, uh, using competitive game theory and the Nash equilibrium for it. And we computed the, if we can compute the Nash, we first of all show that the Nash equilibrium exists. It can be computed. And then we can compute the performance. 
at the Nash equilibrium. And then we can do the worst case, like what is the worst case? And the worst case turns out for this problem is 25 percent. So the performance of a decentralized distributed solution is no worse than 75 percent of the optimal. So the, so the loss is there, but it is not that, not that heavy. So you can live with a decentralized solution. And then we analyze methods for improving efficiency. So I don't know what the best thing to do. I mean, so there is now, you know, mathematical development uh, of this idea. See, I don't know if there is a particular thing that I want. So basically, you get a bunch of, you know, equations that, that are uh, supply equals demand constraints, uh, and then some load constraints, which are inequality constraints. Uh, and then we form the centralized control problem, so which is optimization of that objective function uh, over a search space. And then we do the distributed control problem, which are price taking consumers. Uh, well, this is first with price taking, so there is no game here, they just accept the price. But then the game version is that they will anticipate the impact of their decision on the price and adjust their behavior according to that. That's when it becomes a game. So if, it, if the consumers are price taking, then the distributed solution is, is the same as the centralized solution. That's an interesting result. That for a price taking uh, assumption, there is no difference between centralized optimal and distributed decentralized optimal. So that's one of the results. And, uh, so with price takers, let's see. So that's the, so the main result is that it's a competitive equilibrium if and only if the set of consumptions is the solution to the centralized control problem. So that shows that centralized control is the same as uh, the distributed so, uh, solution uh, under the price taking assumption. But if you have price anticipating users, that is they know how the price is being set by the utility or by whoever is supplying the electricity, then they, c they, then they play a game and we set up the game. So let me see if I can bring you to, so for each, so game is you got n consumers, you got consumer strategy and then each consumer optimizes their payoff. So they maximize, assuming everybody else is playing their own strategy. So the Nash equilibrium is the one where the set of strategies are such that nobody has an incentive to deviate from their chosen strategy. That's the definition of Nash equilibrium uh, for this. And so we prove that Nash equilibrium exists under non, and this is the, the main result. Price of anarchy is uh, 0.75. And so I think what I'm going to do is, and then we've got other results like if all consumers are identical, then it actually goes to one. So this is kind of, it's a very special case. Uh, and then we have a bunch of results that follow up on this. So with that, uh, let me see what is my conclusions. Because I think I'm going to stop there. So as I think I, I hope demonstrated to you that grid integration of renewables is going to become an, a harder and harder and harder control problem as time progresses. As we get closer and closer to this wanted goal, uh, unless something really dramatic happens with storage or one of these grid flexibility options, we are going to be dealing with this very complex control problem of managing supply equals demand. So there are many, many opportunities for systems and control field in this broad area. Uh, we have touched on a few things, but there's just a lot more that can be done. Third point I would make is that energy systems are, uh, I don't have to tell you that because you're all here in the, in the Energy Systems Institute. It's a very interesting space because it's not just engineering. What, I, what was new for me as I got into this business eight, eight, 10 years, eight years ago is, it's a really interesting mix of engineering, social science, economics, public policy, and you really, can't, you really can't think about the problem in isolation. So if you think of it as a purely engineering problem, you're missing like half of the boat, you know? So you've got to mix it up. And I think that's what, that's what makes it interesting. Plus the scale. So if you bring, if you combine this idea that nothing in energy matters if it doesn't scale. Nothing in energy, so if you remember nothing from this talk, remember this. Nothing in energy matters if it doesn't scale. And the scale is literally humongous. Just absolutely mind-blowing scale. And, and I think, de especially I look at the young people in, in this audience, decarbonization is your life's challenge. This I'm absolutely convinced of. I got gray hair, but all of you are going to contribute to, to solving that problem. 
and I'm, I'm confident that with your ingenuity and wonderful education that Cornell is giving you, you guys, will you guys and, and go gals will make a tremendous difference to this existential challenge. With that, I'm going to close and thank you very much for your attention. Oh, okay, go ahead. So you see more residential renewables coming into place and, and kind of taking care of the peak, or you have other options like electric vehicles and people going home and charging them overnight, raising the off-peak usage. Do you see these newer changes in the market helping with the prediction and predictability of control, or do you see these new variables being uh, harmful because it deviates from all of these models so I think the answer to your question is, is a little complex. Uh, on the positive side, if the residential consumers get enough tools and resources to manage their own electricity demand and are able to communicate that in effective ways, then it's a huge plus. If on the other hand, those tools don't come into play, which are, which are in information, communication, control, then you can imagine actually a much worse case where all this stuff is coming online and the grid operator has no visibility beyond the distribution transformer, right? So this is happening, in fact, even behind the meter in many cases. And, and if the grid operators have no idea what's going on there, then their management problem becomes much harder. So, so I think it's going to be a, a, an evolving mix. Can we bring uh, solutions to consumers uh, at economic prices that, that sort of you know, offer value so that they will end up using this communication. It's a smart grid vision of having all this communication and visibility translating into grid operator being able to do a, a, a better job of managing the supply. So I think it's a little more nuanced answer than, um, because there, uh, until very recently, there was a huge worry about lack of visibility on behind the meter. We don't know what's going on behind the meter uh, from a grid operator viewpoint, who's managing the, the total grid. When you formulate these models, right? Yeah. So you have this um, customer side where yeah. the customer, you're assuming, has some kind of strategy. Right. But my impression is that in most grid networks, the um, customers, perhaps in companies, might yeah. have a strategy. Yeah. But the vast majority don't. Yeah. That they are just essentially, right. you know, sitting ducks in a market right. that's yeah. not a market. Yeah. So how is that a company? So, so e models? Well, I mean, if you take the price and price taking user, which is your your version is price taking users, in which case the decentralized solution is as good as the centralized optimal. So that's a good situation. If they don't game, if they don't game, it's a good it's a good thing for the control, optimal control. But so when you write the model, you yeah. put in some fraction who are not gaming. Is that a we have done that work? So we actually did a paper where we said, so there are two things, right? So price taking or price anticipating. And for price anticipating, we say they are going to game to the max, right? Because I say they will optimize with respect to everybody else's behavior in a Nash equilibrium sense. So we said, well, not every consumer is going to do that. Some are going to be what we call irrational consumers. That they'll just consume regardless of the price. They'll just do what they want to do. They don't care either they got enough money or what. Or yeah, or they're passive or, or they make whatever decision they make. So we analyzed this case and we showed that the performance falls somewhere in between. And in fact, you have, if you have too many irrational consumers, they kind of crowd out the rational consumers. Mm -hmm. So we showed, we showed that kind of crowding out effect uh, as well. So we have done some amount of work on the kind of things that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. But like I said, this, this, this is like a really evolving and moving field, right? So there is a, this, this idea of having an aggregator. Mm -hmm. So that's a thing that Elian and I and our uh, colleagues worked on, which is that no consumer is going to try to do this on, on his or her own. They're too busy raising their kids and running their families. They're not going to bother with this. So is there, a, is, there a, is there a role for an aggregator who can take like, you know, 500 consumers and can they sort of manage their consumption, providing benefit to the grid operator and, and providing benefit to the consumer? So, so there are, all these things are in play. And can these things sort of scale and provide the economic value 
uh, as, as renewable penetration increases. Those are all possible solutions that will ultimately come into play. Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.